This man is Japanese General Shiro Ishii. For seven years, he headed a vast secret organization known as Unit 731. Unit 731 manufactured and developed deadly bacteria for use in war. They made anthrax, typhoid, and plague. To study and perfect the killing capacity of these biological weapons, General Ishii experimented on more than 3,000 human beings, including Allied prisoners of war. Yet, unlike his Nazi counterparts, such as Dr. Mengele, Ishii did not have to scuttle away into the depths of a South American jungle at the war's end. Instead, his crimes went unpunished, and he lived out his days quite peacefully here in Japan. Why was that? Why were Ishii and other members of his team permitted to get away with murder? The answer reveals the full horror of the work of Unit 731 and implicates the Japanese and Allied governments at the highest levels. They were, uh, the bodies were put up on uh, autopsy tables and then they would cut them open and so forth and get their uh, organs or parts of organs, whatever they wanted, and they put them in the containers and were marked with the same number as was on the POW tag. What uh, particular organs were they concentrating on? They looked like deep in the stomach, so it was part of, part of the small intestine and look like pancreas and uh, uh, lung and, uh, and brain. And brain as well. And brain as well. Frank James is one of a group of American prisoners who believe the Japanese experimented upon them during the last war. The experiments began in a prisoner of war camp in Manchuria in 1942. The Japanese scientists used chemical sprays, injections, blood samples and rectal smears. And then they come through and they had everybody bent over and they had little glass rods. And they brought, they got one of them shoved up their rear end, you know. And uh, the Jap had so much fun doing it. I remember that. I was pretty sick and I, I, I wouldn't go to the hospital because uh, nobody that went in ever came out. I have told people, when they said, well, Charlie, you didn't die. Well, why so many others? I said, well, maybe I got placebos and they got the shots. I was lying in my bunk in the barracks. And uh, this Japanese, I thought he was a guard. He came in and he had a feather. And he run that feather up and down under my nostrils. And then uh, I discovered that this was one of the methods that they used to get uh, prisoners to ingest bacteria. From the time I've come back, I've, I've suffered with uh, fevers. And the, I went to doctor after doctor, went to specialists, and they can't determine what it is. What did you think the purpose of all this was, Frank? I thought they were researching us, you know. They uh, measured our skulls, uh, our height. That's when they took our blood test also. Why did you think at the time they were measuring you and taking blood tests? I have no idea. They've done many strange things that we never could understand. But if these Americans were experimented upon, none of the scientists responsible was ever prosecuted for war crimes. A secret deal at the end of the war involving General Douglas MacArthur prevented the Japanese being brought to justice. The deal was struck by this man, a former US intelligence officer, Colonel Murray Sanders. This document, seen here for the first time, lies at the heart of the deal, germ warfare secrets in return for immunity from prosecution for Ishii and his men. Today, what does Sanders think of the deal? I think it was a mistake. But my only excuse is that we never would have obtained the data that we got if we hadn't done something like that. Ishii's interest in gas and germ warfare grew from decisions taken at a meeting of the League of Nations in Switzerland in 1925. 29 nations signed a protocol prohibiting the first use of bacteriological methods of warfare. 
six nations failed to ratify the agreement, among them Japan. And from this debate, in the mind of Shiro Ishii, was born an idea. An idea that colleagues who worked with him later watched grow into an obsession. I had the impression that Commander Ishii saw this as a means whereby Japan could conquer the world. At that time, of course, the atomic bomb had not been invented, and the matter of whether the world could be conquered by biological warfare was a topic of much debate. General Ishii's logic was simple. If the rest of the world had banned gas and germ warfare, Japan should have that capability. Besides being a soldier, Ishii was a brilliant bacteriologist. In the 1930s, he set up a small laboratory here at the Army Medical College in Tokyo. There was little support for his ideas on germ warfare, but he was asked to design a pump to purify water. The work quickly had a practical value, as Japan's military ambitions became evident. In 1931, Japan overran Manchuria. Their armies threatened both Russia and China. In 1935, a single incident played into a Xi's hands. Cholera ravaged the Japanese troops. The army blamed a group of spies, caught carrying glass bottles and ampoules containing the germs of dysentery, cholera and anthrax. With these germs, said the Japanese, the spies had poisoned the wells of drinking water. Two thousand horses and six thousand men died. The Kwantung army generals decided they needed protection from germ warfare. Their troops must never again be so vulnerable. Within a matter of months, Ishii was given huge funds to build the world's first major germ warfare installation. It would be in Manchuria at a village called Ping Fan, about 40 miles south of Harbin. It would shelter under the innocuous title of the Anti-Epidemic Water Supply Unit, or Unit 731. By 1939, Ping Fan was a sprawling cluster of laboratories and living quarters, a garrison of 3,000 scientists, technicians and soldiers. Top civilian scientists were secretly drafted there to join the Korea Army doctors. Here, the bacteria of typhus and tetanus, anthrax and smallpox, Salmonella and glanders were nurtured and grown in huge vats. Ishii's unit could produce up to eight tons of bacteria a month, but crucially, he needed to draw a veil of secrecy around his work. So he recruited many of the men and women who ran Ping Fan from this village, Kamo, near Tokyo. Kamo was Ishii's family home. He was the major local landowner, and in taking his villagers with him to Ping Fan, he ensured both loyalty and secrecy. Around 500 of them went. They've never spoken to outsiders about it to this day. Ishii also recruited his two brothers. Mitsuo he put in charge of the animals to be bred for experiments. Takeo controlled what Ishii described as his secret of secrets. In Pingfan, three buildings were enveloped by the strictest security. Men entered and left there through a tunnel usually at night. Hundreds of prisoners were directed to Ping Fan, so-called spies who'd allegedly poisoned the wells, Chinese, Korean, Manchurian and Russian soldiers, petty criminals and dissidents. Ishi gave these men a code name, Marutas. Literally, it means logs of wood. They were known only by numbers. They were to die painfully and anonymously in their thousands, sacrificed in a series of human experiments. In a graveyard in Tokyo, there stands a memorial. A memorial not to those who died at the hand of the most secret records as he printed them. There was a standing order that there should be 60 to 80 marutas in the unit at all times, so facilities were large enough to accommodate that number. There was a maruta supply camp and replacements came as those in the unit died. To the best of my knowledge, the number of prisoners called Marutas sacrificed there up until the end of the war was 2,500 to 3,000. Naoka Ishibashi, now a caretaker, was servant to a senior officer in Unit 731. He also had a more sinister duty. 
My job was to ensure that Marutas were fit for experimentation, and I had to give them health checks on arrival, which included taking their blood count, ensuring healthy kidney function, and so on. The number of Marutas arriving at any one time was usually five or six, but they were not used immediately for experiments, because basic examination had to be completed before this could be done. Sometimes Unit 731 cooperated with other units. This man agreed to talk anonymously about one such joint operation. We experimented with cyanide gas in small bombs. Nearly 100 Maruta were used in the experiment and they all died but for one. The bodies were loaded into trucks, 10 or 20 at a time, and transported to Haruarushan, where tents had been erected for a pathologist to carry out a pathological autopsy. I waited outside the tent to obtain the blood that had been recovered from various organs of the autopsies and placed in tubes, and took these to the military hospital in Hera and assessed the cyanide content of the blood. The prisoners were killed to assess the progress of various diseases. They were shot or injected with morphine. Some were dissected while they were still alive. In Ishii's eyes, the human experiments had been justified to protect the Japanese troops from germ warfare. But all along, he'd also been developing germ warfare as an attacking weapon. US intelligence documents reveal that he built both bombs and shells filled with germs. But when this bomb exploded, the charge was so great it destroyed much of the bacteria. He tried a balloon bomb but its fuse was unreliable and it failed to explode at the altitude that would have spread the germs most effectively. Next, Ishii invented this bomb, the Uji bomb. It was made of ceramic so that the charge to break the casing could be small, but the fins were unreliable. The bombs were tested on experimental stations near Ping Fan. Here, they exploded both bombs and shells near prisoners they'd staked out in a huge open field. Documentary proof of this series of experiments turned up surprisingly 40 years later in Tokyo. One day in 1984, Professor Matsumura was browsing with a friend through the shelves of second-hand books when they found a set of remarkable papers. These are the actual scientific record of a number of killings, chronicled by the Japanese scientists who carried out the experiments in Unit 731. On this occasion, the prisoners were murdered with mustard gas. Professor Matsumura, how many men were actually involved in this particular series of experiments in Unit 731? Uh, Twenty men were involved. How far away from the center of where the gas bomb exploded were these men placed? I'll show you a map. Uh, these are the Maltas. Five Maltas were located. And each has a number, I see. Yes. And this is the direction of gas. Mm. Uh, how were the men dressed during these experiments? Uh, some were exposed without gas masks, and some were with ma gas masks, and some were uh, under the shelter, mm. and they were located in different conditions. You found another document. What uh, does that one tell you? Uh, this document shows that 14 cases uh, of the germ of uh, tetanus were given, uh, injected into the heels of Marutas. In case of uh, Maruta number 691, mm. he was dead after, uh, five days after the experiment. What about Maruta number 991? Yes. In case, uh, in this case, 10 days after the experiment, uh, the tension of muscle was Increased. near zero. Near zero. Um, so so ten, dead. Days, 10 days after the experiment, he was there. Many of the leading members of Japan's scientific community were involved in the work of Unit 731. Dr. Hideo Tanaka was a plague expert he became director of Osaka County University's School of Medicine. Dr. Yukimoso Yagesawa worked on ways of spreading diseases on wheat. He became secretary of the Japanese Penicillin Association. 
Dr. Tazuyomaru Ishikawa was a pathologist. He became a professor at Kanazawa University. He secretly took to the university specimens of his human experiments. Dr. Takeo Tamiya was Unit 731's recruiting officer. He became emeritus professor at Tokyo University and president of the Japanese Medical Association. By our calculations, around 10,000 people connected with Ishii's units slipped back into Japanese society at the end of the war and kept their mouths shut about what they'd done and seen. One of them is now Emeritus Vice President here at the Kitasato Hospital and Research Institute in Tokyo. His name, Dr. Shiro Kasahara. I got in to see Kasahara. He's written many medical publications, some of them, I told him, undoubtedly based on his human experiments at Ping Fan. Kasahara understands a little English. He agreed to an interview on his work at Ping Fan, provided he could answer in Japanese. Kasahara was recruited by General Kitano, who took over Unit 731 when Ishii was recalled to Japan. Mr. Kitano was a professor at the University of Manchuria, and so he had a natural interest in medical research. He said that he earnestly wished for me to take part in the Songo fever research. And so, reluctantly, I went to Manchuria in 1941. In addition to myself, Mr. Ishii had gathered the most proficient people from universities and research laboratories. Professors, assistant professors, directors and assistant directors. For those that would not agree to joining him, he arranged that they should receive red papers, which meant they were conscripted into the unit. In the year I was with them, the Ishii unit was ordered to carry out research into a mysterious disease that was affecting soldiers. So officers and the technicians, the brilliant people from the universities and laboratories, and myself, went to a place called Songo, near the Soviet border. When I arrived there, I found their work involved obtaining mites from rats captured in the area of Songo, where the disease was most prevalent. And from these, they made a solution for injecting into spies captured in Manchuria. I was only accustomed to university laboratories and university-style research. And until I went to the Ishii unit, I didn't even know such a thing as human experiment existed or what the word Maruta meant. I was very naive. One had to approach one's own administration department and receive approval of the commander to become a custodian of a Maruta. Only then could injections be made, and the total number of people I used, in all sincerity, I believe amounted to five or six. But medical papers and U.S. intelligence reports on Songo or epidemic hemorrhagic fever bear the names of Professor Kasahara and General Kitano. They contradict the figures of human experiments that Kasahara gives. In the human experiments uh, involving uh, epidemic hemorrhagic fever, there were apparently 101 uh, people sacrificed. Do you accept that number? I cannot accept the figure of 101. I never counted them, but it is incredible. I cannot believe it. But to experiment on, uh, let alone to kill, uh, even one prisoner of war is against the Geneva Convention, never mind medical ethics. Yes, I think it was a contravention. They were soldiers, prisoners of war, and I think the Japanese army was wrong. What about your part in the work of Unit 731? Do you have any conscience about that? I feel very guilty about what I've done, and I think I did wrong. So how is it that Kasahara and hundreds of scientists like him escaped retribution for their war crimes? Shiro Ishii discovered what many had found before him, that to develop a weapon to conquer the world is beset with pitfalls. His germ warfare experiments at Ping Fan were running into difficulties. The bombs and shells weren't working. So he turned to the humble flea and built a factory to breed them in their millions. The fleas have been exposed to plague-carrying rats, and I think these infected fleas were scattered from aircraft. Therefore, they were used for spreading bubonic plague. On October 4th, 1940, in Chekiang province, this plane from Unit 731 sprayed the civilian population with fleas, rice and wheat infected with plague. On October 
October 29, 1940, plague broke out in Ningpo in Chekiang province. There was another raid at Qinghua on November 28, 1940. Another at Changte on November 4, 1941. Bubonic plague is what was known in the Middle Ages as the Black Death. Victims swell, blacken and die. In the 14th century, there were no medical defences against it. In China, in the 1940s, thousands of people were hospitalised. 700 died. Soon, every division of the Kwantung Army had its own squad trained in germ warfare. In July 1942, rivers near the Soviet border were contaminated with anthrax and glanders. In August 1942, 130 kilos of anthrax and paratyphoid were spread effectively in central China. But another operation went badly wrong. They also went to central China when about three divisions of soldiers were dispatched together with the anti-bacteriological water supply group of Unit 731 who rapidly withdrew after an outbreak of cholera and typhus had been started with dispersion of bacteria in the area. So secret had that operation been that the Japanese troops themselves had become the victims. 1,700 of them died, infected by the germs Unit 731 had spread to kill the enemy. By 1941, Britain and the United States were China's allies against Japan. China's leader, Chiang Kai-shek, sent a top-secret memo to Winston Churchill, detailing the Japanese plague attacks. The memo alerted the allies, Britain, the US and Russia, to the need to re-examine their own germ warfare program. By 1942, the Japanese were celebrating victory in their first clashes with American land forces. In the Philippines, there'd been an epic battle. On April 9th, Bataan had fallen. On May 6th, so had Corregidor. Apart from the dead, 88,000 American and Filipinos were captured. They quickly discovered the Japanese attitude to prisoners of war. To die in battle is honorable. To be captured is to be shamed. These American troops were forced marched for days without food and water to the ports of the Philippines. More than 1,100 prisoners, American and Filipino, died. They were herded aboard Japanese ships and in horrific conditions, they were taken to Korea. They were joined by about 100 British and Australian prisoners of war and boarded trains to Manchuria, to a place called Mukden. It was November 1942. But why should these Americans who survived the experience have been taken all that way to Mukden? From the time we left the Philippines, they were experimenting on us. They threw us in those hell ships, see how much we could withstand. And many of them died in the, in the hell ships. They th took us from the tropics to a, to a cold climate, and that took its toll on, on the, the prisoners. And all this time, I feel like it was a, a systematic way of them testing how much the Americans or British and Australians could endure. Major Robert Peaty was the senior British officer at Mukden. He kept a diary, and it lists a series of tests of the prisoners' blood and feces. He remembers that his captors didn't wish to discuss them. The Japanese seemed to try to keep me out of the hospital and with the sick people as, as far as they could without actually denying me access. They made it pretty obvious that I would be very unwelcome to pry into any sort of sickness or ill health. That first winter, out of 1,450 prisoners at Mukden, 430 died. But were they experimented upon? What evidence is there that Ishii tried to find out if Americans and Europeans would react to germs differently from Asians and Russians? Well, Mukden is just 350 miles from Unit 731's headquarters at Ping Fan. And there is clear evidence that scientists from Pingfan went to Mukden. There were about 3,000 prisoners under confinement, and many of our scientific teams went there. And I don't know for what purpose, but they most certainly did go there. To the best of my recollection, the report which we prepared almost wholly related to malnutrition. Jack Roberts was a sergeant in the camp hospital. He remembers prisoners being measured with calipers, series of injections and inoculations, and bodies being dissected by visiting Japanese scientists. 
Well, it was pretty, uh, pretty obvious to me that we were being used as guinea pigs for some reason that we were not aware of and we hadn't been told about. It. Who were carrying out these tests? Well, we had this group of strangers who appeared in the camp. Uh, we don't know where they'd come from. We were never given any information. They were dressed differently to the normal camp staff. They carried out these uh, uh, operations and then they disappeared and we never saw or heard of them again. The scientists who came here most were those concentrating on the use of dysentery as a weapon of war. One of them, for seven years a member of Unit 731, was Tsuneji Shimada. He was a laboratory technician. He lives in Osaka. He would talk to me only on the telephone. I was in the dysentery group and we studied whether this could be developed for use in weapons. Normally we gave them infected materials to drink and carried out autopsies to ascertain the symptoms. We had to observe the progress and had to ascertain the potency of the various viruses. Were any blood samples ever taken from the Mukden prisoner of war camp? Yes, we also actually carried out the same experiments at the headquarters of Unit 731. But by 1944, the tide was turning against the Japanese, and in 1945, Russia entered the war. They swept through Manchuria towards Ping Fan. The advance was too rapid, even for the germ weapons Xi was stockpiling, to be mobilized against them. All evidence of the horrific work at Ping Fan had to be destroyed. First priority was the disposal of the Maruta material. After they had all been killed, their remains were incinerated. Then, for the disposal of the pathological specimens, there was special incineration equipment. But its capacity was inadequate for the job. So, some of the specimens were transported to the incineration plant in Harbin. After that, each barracks was set alight, which was the job assigned to me. And all important buildings in Pinfang were destroyed by explosives laid down by a sapper unit called in especially to assist us. A small section was left behind to verify that everything had been satisfactorily destroyed. After the prisoners had been killed and the documents destroyed, all the members of Unit 731 were issued with cyanide capsules. They were ordered to use them if they were captured. The secret of secrets had to be kept. In August 1945, the war was ended. Not by a biological weapon, but by an atomic bomb. The destruction of Ping Fan was complete, and the Xi and his men mingled with the retreating armies to hide from justice. On September 2nd, 1945, aboard the battleship Missouri in Tokyo Bay, the United States accepted the unconditional surrender of the Japanese forces. A time then for justice, and amid the chaos of a defeated Japan, the Allies hunted for the Japanese who should be brought to trial. The Xi and his men hid and waited. Surprisingly, Ishii was hopeful. He knew the unique scientific value of the work he'd done, and he guessed correctly that America and Russia would want it. The most technically advanced country in bacterial technology was Russia, followed by Germany and then Japan. These three countries were very progressive in this field. But America, and of course England, were not so advanced. America desperately wanted to acquire as much knowledge as possible about bacterial technology. So even as the occupying troops arrived in Japan, Unit 731 drew up a plan to trade this valuable information. The linchpin was an English-speaking member of the unit, Lieutenant Colonel Ryohi Naito. Somehow, Naito found out which American officer would be in charge of investigating germ warfare. He got a photograph of the man, Colonel Murray Sanders, and he was waiting when the ship carrying Sanders arrived in Japan. My mission was biological warfare. I was to find what the Japanese had done. And when the Sturgis docked dockside at Yokohama, uh, there was Dr. Naito, oh, he came straight toward me. Well, he seemed to have had a photograph of me and said that he was my interpreter. 
Did you at that time know that he was a member of Unit 731? I didn't even know what 731 was. Apparently he was a very humble, shy person, very careful, went home every night, came back early the next morning, if you're interested, I found out later that he didn't go home, but went to the various Japanese headquarters. To sort out the information that they were right. going to give you the next day. Right. And to report on the progress of our mission. Was it his job to see to it that you didn't learn too much? Absolutely. So Sanders and Naito engaged in a game of bluff and double bluff. The American threatened the Japanese. I said... Not only would I be replaced by an extremely tough man, but that this would also put the communists in the picture. Now, I said that because the Japanese exhibited a deadly fear of the communists, and they certainly didn't want them messing around. He appeared the next morning early with a manuscript which contained startling material. It was fundamentally dynamite. This said, in essence, that the Japanese were involved in biological warfare. Naito also set out the entire chain of command for the war criminals of Unit 731. He laid out a table of organization which started with the Emperor and branched off into the various departments, War Department, Ch Chiefs of Staff, Medical Affairs Department, and so forth. All of them implicated plus or minus. Do you believe that the Emperor was aware of the work of Unit 731? I think he must have known something, because the budget was very large. And the people involved were top level. A document held in Japan's military archives reveals that the unit was formed by imperial decree. That is, the emperor's seal is on the document. We also know that the emperor's brother, Prince Mikasa, visited Ping Fan. More than that, the emperor himself went to Manchuria at least once, in 1939, when the work of Ping Fan was at its height. Certainly, he must have known about the garrison at Ping Fan. But did he know of the human experiments? In the Japanese system, reports on important research would have been circulated to all in the cycle, and intermediate termination of the flow is inconceivable. I appreciate, therefore, that there was much discussion about the responsibility of the emperor. But, myself, I think it is ridiculous to believe that such information was not circulated to the emperor. There was a comprehensive attempt to conceal the truth from the Allies. In the document Naito gave Colonel Sanders, there's a note tacked on the end. Sanders wrote, I've asked Dr. Naito whether prisoners of war were used as guinea pigs. He vows this has not been the case. But did even Sanders, desperate for information, believe it? For a very short time. Did it, in a way, suit you to believe him when he said he didn't use uh, human beings as guinea pigs? Well, it made it easier for me to be friends with him. Uh, but did it also make it easier for you to protect him, in a way? Yes. By all means. Believing Naito freed Sanders from moral constraints. He formulated an agreement. I looked on this document as the opening of a gate. It showed me where I could go and what to do. Sanders took the document directly to General MacArthur. He suggested the deal to MacArthur. The Allies wanted the information from Unit 731, so could he offer immunity from prosecution in return for the Japanese data? He said, well, if you feel you cannot get all the information, we are not given to torture. There's nothing we can do about it. So offer them the deal. So we offer him the promise as coming from General MacArthur and get the data. I went back to Naito and said, 
told him that we would not prosecute. I had General MacArthur's word for it. BW workers as war criminals. This made a deep impression and the data came in waves after that. Thick and fast. Thick and fast. We could hardly keep up with it. In January 1946, free from the fear of prosecution, Ishii emerged from hiding. He began to talk to the Americans about his work. He knew the Russians would also be seeking him and his information. They'd captured 12 germ warfare experts in Manchuria. Sure enough, according to this US intelligence document, the Russians did ask the Americans to release Ishii to them for questioning. The Russians requested that General MacArthur arrange for the handing over of General Ishii to them, but Ishii went to discuss this with MacArthur, stressing that he had no intention of going to Russia. In the office of General MacArthur, there was a man called General Sams, who agreed that he should not go, and said, conversely, that all the information should be handed to the Americans. If he did this, he and all the members of Unit 731 would be considered not guilty of any charge. This was clearly stated, and so Ishii took full responsibility for gathering and handing over all the information to the Americans. This is truly what actually happened. So the bargain was struck. Yet, as MacArthur prepared to bring other Japanese war criminals to justice, there's evidence that he knew of the human experiments carried out by Ishii's units. In May 1947, MacArthur radioed to the War Department, top secret, experiments on humans were confirmed tacitly by Ishii. Reluctant statements by Ishii indicated he had superiors who knew and authorized the program. In September 1947, again top secret, the State Department warned MacArthur and the Army and the Navy about the deal. It is recognized, they said, that this government may at a later date be seriously embarrassed. They'd already discussed that independent investigation by the Soviets in the Mukden area may have disclosed evidence that American prisoners of war were used for experimental purposes and that they lost their lives as a result of the experiments. But MacArthur pressed ahead with the deal. Then, in October 1947, two American scientists, Edwin Hill and Joseph Victor, came to Japan to assess the value of Ishii's work. They interviewed the Unit 731 scientists, Ishii, Kitano, Kasahara and the rest. And the American investigators reported, such information could not be obtained in our own laboratories because of the scruples attached to human experimentation. The trial of Japanese war criminals, begun in Tokyo in May 1946, had already lasted a year. The trial ended in April 1948. It had lasted two years. But in the thousands of pages of evidence and depositions, there's not a single mention of Unit 731. In contrast, the Russians brought their Unit 731 criminals to trial and gave them up to 25 years in jail. But the Americans had the information they wanted and Ishii and his men emerged scot-free. But there was another important consideration. The Emperor had escaped association with Ishii's experimental work on human beings. He never stood trial to answer for the crimes of his nation, not least because the Allies needed him to preserve some stability in a land reeling in defeat. They needed him to introduce a new democratic constitution to a newly elected parliament. There seems little doubt that the Americans and the Japanese protected the Emperor from implication in and possible prosecution over any war crime. Meanwhile, Shiro Ishii was living in Tokyo. Then, in 1948, he suddenly disappeared. I am told that he gave some lectures, a series of lectures that included human testing of infectious organisms in a special camp in the United States. He went into detail as to the method of injection and the reaction of the prisoners, and he gave some results. Do you know this, Dr. Sanders? I got the information from a high-ranking officer on the condition that his name not be mentioned. You are in no doubt in your own mind that it is true. I believe it, yes. 
the, the game is uh, you, you buy a lot for a little, and, and that's what they did. They gave us a, a few little prisoners uh, death to, to get, gain a lot of knowledge for their own research programs to make uh, bacterial stuff that they, even they can't even haul through half of the towns of this country. Our government should have notified us so we could have been on the lookout for any repercussions from the experiments. And I'm very disappointed in our government that they have done this. I think I think it's pretty terrible, and I, I think our government should should fess up and 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 try to even help the few of us that are left. German Today, 40 years on, and as the extent of the horrific work of Unit 731 emerges, these American prisoners are fighting for compensation. They feel let down and angry. They're calling for a full congressional investigation. The U.S. government may be on the threshold of the embarrassment forecast by this intelligence document 40 years ago. The congressman will find that the work of Unit 731 spread across the entire Far Eastern theater of war. In places as far apart as Nanking and Burma, there are further allegations of human experimentation. As for the men of Unit 731, after the war, many of them prospered. Scores went to work in a new company Dr. Naito set up the Green Cross Corporation. Naito befriended his former interrogator, Murray Sanders. He visited the Sanders home in Florida. He entertained the Sanders family in Japan. Well, after the war, I saw many of these people, both in Tokyo and in the Green Cross blood transfusion, blood processing plant, including Kitano. Naito had employed them, you mean? Yes. The Green Cross mainly works in blood. They were originally established as a blood bank in 1948. They extract plasma, albumin, and gamma globulin from blood. And this is identical to the work that members of Unit 731 were doing in Harbin. So it was logical and convenient that they should employ such experienced people when and where they could find them. And that is why so many former members of Unit 731 were employed by the Green Cross. The Green Cross Corporation has grown into one of the most successful drug companies in Japan. In 1985, its profits were forecast at more than 6,000 million yen. Dr. Naito died in 1982, a rich man. But not before he'd approved plans for this new multi-million dollar research institute named after him to be built in Los Angeles, USA. And Shiro Ishii? Well, ironically, he suffered in his later years from chronic dysentery and internal inflammation, diseases he'd inflicted on others at Ping Fan. Like them, he was to die, slowly and painfully, of cancer of the throat. It's too late now to bring many of the Unit 731 scientists to justice. But the morality of what these men did in the name of science raises questions that today still remain to be answered, just as the arrangement that protected them from prosecution could yet embarrass the governments of great nations. <laughs>